What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. On the Warriors front, first of all, it's the end of an era. Six conference titles, four NBA titles, bona fide top-tier contender in seven of those 10 years. The other years were all kind of injury-related, right, with the exception of last year, which kind of felt like the first year of the decline. But it's just kind of sad to see the the trio broken up. Uh, but it's just the reality of the second apron rules. I, I, I'm going to list these again when we talk Paul George, but to, to just give you guys a really quick breakdown. If you are in the second apron, you have no access to the mid-level exception, which means you cannot sign a player above the cap unless it's a veteran minimum contract. You cannot take on additional money in trades. You have to trade out more money. You cannot aggregate salaries in trades. So if you see a player that makes $20 million and you want to trade two $10 million players to get there, can't do it. You cannot um, use cash in trades to help kind of facilitate that uh, the money balance. You cannot buy second-round draft picks. Remember when the Warriors bought that second-round draft pick for Jordan Bell? Can't do that anymore. Um you can't use trade exceptions to match salary. You can't use your own free agents and sign in trades. If you stay in the second apron multiple years, it affects your ability to use first round picks and future trades. Like it is incredibly punitive to be in that zone. And so I think the reality was is the Warriors are just trying to get out of that second apron. Well, Lakeup is trying to quickly relieve himself of the salary crunch that he was in last season, right? Now, he quickly pivoted. They just signed DeAnthony Melton to the non-taxpayer mid-level exception, a contract that they would not have been able to sign unless they let Clay go. And I love DeAnthony Melton, for the record. I thought it was a really nice pickup, and we're going to talk about him in just a second. But make no mistake, this was a cost-saving move in general from Golden State. Not just the Clay Thompson piece, but letting Clay uh, uh, waiving Chris Paul so that you didn't have to pay his $30 million salary next year. Right, So you lose all that salary, which helps you in terms of the tax, but obviously you lose the ability to use Chris Paul as a vehicle to bring in another player in a trade, and you lose Clay Thompson, who is a, a, you know an important kind of like structural piece of your team, right? Now, here's the deal with DeAnthony Melton. I think he is like the next best thing to KCP in terms of like he's just a rock solid NBA starter, good athlete, good perimeter defender can guard up and down a little bit. He's a good rebounder, can shoot and attack closeouts, just like a consummate professional, rock-solid NBA starter. Like, if you've got enough talent in terms of your stars, you're never going to be worried about what DeAnthony Melton is or isn't doing for your team, provided that he's healthy. Obviously, he was hurt much of last year. So within the context of helping Steph and accentuating him as a backcourt partner, love the DeAnthony Melton fit. But... If they aren't willing or able to trade for a legitimate secondary shot creator, they're just still in a lot of trouble in this upcoming season. This team missed the playoffs last year in a field that allowed 10 teams in in the Western Conference. So, like, I'm hoping that this is in the context of some sort of other move. I had heard there was some reporting that the Warriors had an offer on the table from Chicago asking for Wiggins and Chris Paul for Zach Levine, and the Warriors turned it down. Now, for obvious reasons, Lakeup was trying to get out of that second apron, right? But, like, Zach Levine is a guy that, you know, even for all his flaws, you know, that's why he's available for Chris Paul and and Andrew Wiggins. You're not in the market for the more expensive stars, right? So, like, Zach Levine could have at least been an option to provide some real shot creation and an influx of talent, and the Warriors just said, no, thank you. So I hope they have something else up their sleeves because I think Steph's going to have a bounce-back year next year. It'd be a damn shame to ask him to grind through another rebuild. I shouldn't say another, but a rebuild out of a sense of loyalty to the franchise when he has superstar years left in him. It's a waste. He's too good to be wasted on a rebuilding roster that can't contend in the Western Conference. And like Steph's not the kind of guy who would ask for a trade. So I really, really hope that Golden State and their uh, decision makers, Joe Lacob and Mike Dunleavy, I hope that they snap out of it and I hope they do something aggressive because I, I just I, I really don't want to watch Steph Curry play meaningless basketball next year. And DeAnthony Melton's a good player and a really nice pickup, and they're going to have a certain amount of talent, 
But as good as Jonathan Kaminga can be, he's not there yet. As good as the other young players on that roster can be, they aren't there yet. This team does not have enough firepower. And I hope they have a plan to address that before we get to training camp. Moving on to the Clippers. Again, just the reality of the second apron rules. For the sake of the people that might see this uh, in a breakout clip, the I'm going to list the the uh, the the kind of ramifications of being in that second apron. No access to the mid level exceptions. You cannot sign players for anything other than vet- than the veteran minimum contract. You can't take on additional money in trades. It used to be you could go over a certain percentage. You can't do that now. Can't aggregate salaries in trades. You can't so like you can't partner two ten million dollar contracts to trade for a twenty million dollar guy. Can't use cash in trades to make up for a gap. Can't buy second round draft picks. A lot of second round draft picks you just throw two or three million bucks get a second round pick. Can't do that anymore in the second apron. Can't use trade exceptions. Can't use your own free agents in sign and trades. There are all these restrictions that come from being in that second apron, and it's just clear that Steve Ballmer doesn't want to operate like that. And like. Again, like it's a profoundly restrictive zone to be in. And there's like pretty much one team that you see that's in that situation where it kind of makes some sense, and that's the Boston Celtics. They signed Derek White to this four year, $126 million deal, but it's like they don't really have to need to, to like improve the roster over the summer, right? Like Boston's got their five. As long as those five guys are, re- as long as four of those five guys are healthy, they're still the best team in the league. So like they they don't need to go everything for the Boston is a luxury. The Clippers situation is totally different. Now, they had a dominant stretch this year. They had a stretch where they looked better than the Celtics. From November 17th to February 5th, the Clippers were 31 and 8. That was the best record in the league over that span by a wide margin. They had a 5% better win percentage than the Celtics did over that span. And that's almost half a season. They were first in offense, they were 11th in defense. They were kicking everybody's butt. So the counterpoint of view here would be we were a bona fide top tier championship contender and our superstar got hurt. Why don't we run it back and see if we have better luck, right? And that would be the case for retaining Paul George and going into the second apron. But here's the more realistic point of view. That same superstar who was unable to go this year has been unable to go Four consecutive postseasons. He's either been completely hurt and missed it entirely, or three times he made it into the playoffs. Uh, Twice he made it into the playoffs healthy, played, looked great, then got hurt. Another time came into the playoffs hurt, tried to play, ended up staying hurt. Right? It's four years in a row. In addition to that, Paul George looked pretty underwhelming in the Mavs series. He shot just 14 for 43 on pull-up jumpers. He shot below 50% on layups. He made just 10 shots at the rim in total over a six-game series. He was their highest usage rate player. He had a higher usage rate than James Harden out of any Clipper starter, and he didn't even average 20 points a game in that series. So when they needed him to step up and play like a superstar, he did not reach that level. And so while it's hard to stomach as a Clippers fan losing a player like Paul George and effectively losing your championship ceiling... Paul George is going to be 35 years old in the playoffs last year. We just talked about how much he struggled. Kawhi Leonard has all of these issues. It looked like a small likelihood that everyone would stay healthy again. So the Clippers are looking at the situation and they're saying, we're going to have to tweak the roster. We're going to have to make moves. We're going to have to aggregate salaries. We're going to have to do all of these things to try to field a competitive roster going into the future. The only way they'll have that flexibility is if they let Paul George go. And so they had to. So the question is, where do the Clippers go from here? Resigning James Harden was really smart. He's still one of the best regular season offensive engines in the, in the league. Whatever you think about him in the playoffs, he's still a very good regular season offensive engine. Even if Kawhi misses time again, he can help the, the, the Clippers as they go into this new arena. He can help the Clippers still field a respectable basketball team in that new arena. And most importantly, he's still a very tradable contract. $35 million a year, only two years. No one's taking on some sort of long-term commitment. It's not a, like you can make... You can trade two mid-level salaries to make that fit, right? If the Clips decide to pivot to a full rebuild halfway through next season or next summer, James Harden will fetch a couple of picks or a couple of good young players. 
So that you had to pick one of them. I think James Harden will have more trade value. So in terms of asset management, keeping Harden at two years for 35 was a better deal than signing Paul George to four years, 200. You had a much harder contract to trade, right? This maintains their flexibility. The Derrick Jones Jr. fit makes a ton of sense. In the short term, he's an excellent point of attack defender. Demonstrated that in the postseason last year. He's a solid closeout attacker. He's a good play finisher. Play finishers play well alongside James Harden because James Harden spoon feeds you those opportunities, right? And like in this particular situation as well, he is another tradable asset. He has an achievable low salary. He has a position that everyone's looking for. Everyone wants a guy who can guard the other team's best player. That's something Derrick Jones can do. And so, like, look, if Kawhi is healthy next year and plays like an MVP, they're going to be a respectable team fighting in the middle of the Western Conference. I don't think they have a championship ceiling, but they'll be fighting. If Kawhi gets hurt and they decide they want to pivot to rebuild, you just signed two really good trade assets that you can turn around and flip to try to spark that rebuild process, right? So like I I I liked it for the Clippers. It's not it's not a fun move, but it's an it's an it's a demonstration of self awareness and a first step towards the next phase of this franchise with some flexibility in different directions they can go. They can go soft rebuild, they can go hard rebuild. They have some flexibility now that would not have existed had they resigned Paul George. So I like the move. 